it's my pleasure to introduce to you our speaker for today. Um, his name is Dennis Parl or Parlay. He'll maybe sell, tell you the difference there when he talks. <laughs> and um, he's a senior industrial electrician at Valley Water. Welcome, Dennis. Thank you, Robert. Hello, everybody at Bayworks. Uh, anyway, uh, so you guys have all gathered today to uh, get a little instruction from me on electrical safety. And specifically, this is for emergency contact release. Uh, we'll be talking about several uh, aspects of, of that release. Um, you know, uh, whether you would be working with somebody because you've been appointed to do so or and uh, what you'd be expected to wear and and if you were to come across somebody that is being electrocuted, uh, the best way to handle that situation. So I'm Dennis Parlay, also Parl. Uh, <laughs> my, my American name is Parl. Grandma, when she came across from Ireland, it used to be uh, uh, Parlay uh, then, and they changed it to Parl because an Irish priest told her to. So the family goes back and forth uh, on using that pronunciation. So they're both correct. Uh, Parlay sounds really cool with wine. I made wine for a couple of years, so that's that looks good on a label. So, why is electrical safety important? Well, if you were the guy wearing this glove you'd, and you were left-handed, you'd have a heck of a time holding the pencil after uh, after this explosion here. You can see all the fingertips blowing off. I don't hear nobody laughing. Okay, it's a dry room, huh? All right. Well, it let's get right to the to the meat of it, you guys. The Everyone is muted, Dennis. That's all. Oh, that's what it is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> At least I you got to let the laughter go on in your head. In your head. Okay. Ah! <laughs> Thank you, Robert. <laughs> Welcome, brother. So, why is electrical safety important? So, I'm just going to go ahead and read. A lot of these slides I'll end up reading you guys. It's just the best way to, to, to talk about it. So it's to protect personnel by reducing exposure to major electrical hazards. It's to ensure the safety of employees who may work on or near electrical equipment. And it's to help employees avoid workplace injuries and fatalities due to shock, electrocution, arc flash, and arc blast hazards. Okay, I'm still trying to figure out what's going to be the, no. I am having trouble advancing my screen. All right, I got it. So what we're going to do is review a, uh, a video here that we picked out. And, uh, and you know what, With, in, the, in the cursor view where I have uh, the pointer as laser pointer, that's what's going on. That's what, that's what's going on. Okay, I got it. So we're going to watch this video. Uh, this is about a guy that uh, is an electrician and uh, has a family and what happened to him. I've got up that day. The standard day, you know, thinking anything of it. Rewind it a little bit, Dennis, so they can get the first beginning. Quality assessment we had to do. Come on, cooperate. You know, I was telling, uh, I was telling somebody earlier, it's easier to deal with 21,000 volts in these computers. I've been an electrician for about 18 years now, and I'm very confident in what I do, and I still ended up in hospital. I've got up that day, the standard day, you know, thinking anything of it. I says, like, I'll bounce in and do that power quality assessment we had to do. I'd assess the work to be done live, and I was very confident of what I had to get done and was possible to do it live. All I need to do is clip on these four crocodile clips, which isn't a hard task, you know what I mean? I can see the buzz bar. I've clipped on the first one and then I've went to clip on the second one. And as soon as I've touched it, it's just went, just white, yellow flashed, you know what I mean, in my face and just a really disgusting noise. I, don't, I wasn't unconscious, but I sort of realised what had happened and I could just smell it, all my hair burnt, my skin was all burning, and I could see all my clothes were burnt and things, my skin was hanging off and that. And I was just all black. Mm -hmm. 
So when I first found out that he had the accident, I was at work. But when I answered the phone, I couldn't actually understand what he was saying. It was all gibberish. and But all I got was, I'm in a bad way. I'm being taken to hospital. I just like panicked, yeah. <laughs> In uh, Mark's case, while he was working in the switchboard, as a result of attempting to pull off two pieces of insulation, he exposed the risk of, of two separate electrical phases. In bridging that out with his screwdriver, he's created a large arc flash with hot old current available inside the switchboard, which resulted in uh, a large fireball, which burnt Mark considerably. When I first walked in to see him, he was in a hospital bed and he was just black and black and his hair was singed and... The injuries that I actually sustained would have been, uh, it was actually 12% body burns, so that involved skin grafts. For that to heal, they cut or you know, they grind your skin off and then lay that on top of the burns. So the next day after the skin grafts, as soon as I walked into his room in the burns ward, he was just head to toe in bandages. He looked like a, a mummy. I think that's when it hit me. The first week was, was not a, a, an enjoyable time. I was on splints, you know, in full arm splints, leg splints, couldn't even pick my own nose. Um, every second day I had to get all my dressings took off. So you've got dressings stuck on the skin grafts or sticking to you, so you need to go into a shower um, and then get all wetted up to release like all the stickiness of it and then take it off and it just sticks to your skin and it's, it's sore. I didn't know what it was going to look like. I ended up in the hospital for three weeks and yeah, off work for three months. And what I didn't realise then due to what I was going through, how it hurt Mel, how it had emotionally strained her and mentally and emotionally. It's not a nice feeling to know that the person you love is obviously upset and hurt because of what's happened to you. Mark definitely didn't realise how much his accident had affected me a realisation of how serious it was. He could have died. Yeah, just had no idea. <laughs> when Mark started having his rehab, that was hard because he had been in hospital for such a long period of time without moving. He was really happy when he called me that he told me he'd walked for the first time with a Zimmer frame. So he still had to lean on it, but I was really proud. There's also a big emotional burden that's getting put on your loved ones, whether it be your wife, you know what I mean, your family, your parents, or something like this puts an emotional burden on them. He loves his work. He loves to be always, you know, keeping his mind active. So when he couldn't go straight back to work, that also held some frustrations and some, I think some, a little bit of anger. I was really happy to see him back at work. I do want to be with him for the rest of my life. So I am grateful that he has healed. You can prevent arc flash by eliminating the hazard. Turn the power off and isolate the equipment. Even if that means rescheduling the work for another time. Remember, working near energised parts can be just as dangerous as performing live work. Arc flash risk isn't just limited to large switchboards. They can also occur in smaller switchboards, electrical supply pillars, and even large electrical equipment. So plan your work and always follow your safe working procedures. Yeah, I think one thing that I would like to get out there after my accident is just to all the other sparkies out there, just just don't work live. Don't put yourself in situations where, or like I was, just because you're trying to please the client, just because you're trying to get the job done faster. If you've got a wife, kids, family, like it's just not worth it. Nothing's worth your life.
did uh, anybody else catch any other observations uh, about what was going on? He, he was actually wearing that day what he was wearing in the video. Anybody see that? Any takers? No PPE, they say. Someone said no PPE, several people. No PPE. No PPE. Uh, or Santa Polo. Yeah, so this stuff's serious, you guys. Uh, so I've been in the industry 36 years. Uh, I was a young foreman. Arc Flash gear had just come out. Um, we got given one set for everybody's share, and it was an old heavy 40 calorie suit. Uh, and uh, we had one guy in the crew that liked having it because he would actually wear the jacket to lunch and stuff like that. And one morning we gave that suit to, to Tony and uh, uh, we heard an explosion, went in the next room. And when I saw Tony laying on the sheetrock, he was actually smoking. He didn't even put the suit on. And it's uh, it's serious business, you guys. Uh, really scary when you see something like that. So uh, let's go ahead and discuss a few definitions here. So uh, our clash hazard, it's a dangerous condition associated with, uh, let's see if I can move this. There we go, hold on. There we go. Uh, arc flash, a dangerous condition associated with the possible release of energy caused by an electric arc. Uh, flash protection boundary or an arc flash boundary is uh, when an arc flash hazard exists, an approach limit at a distance from a prospective art source with one which a person could receive a second degree burn uh, if an electrical arc flash were to occur. So that's the area that that, that explosion can happen in. So limited approach boundary is uh, an, a, an approach limit at a distance from which an exposed energized electrical con uh, conductor or circuit part within which a shock hazard exists. And then a restricted approach boundary is an approach limit at a distance from an exposed energized electrical conductor or circuit part within which there is a likelihood of electric shock due to electric arc over combined with inadvertent movement from personnel in close proximity to energized electrical conductor or circuit part. So basically when you're sticking your hands in the panel, that's what that boundary is. Qualified person. Well, a qualified person is one who has demonstrated skills and knowledge related to the construction and operation of electrical equipment and installation and has received safety training to identify and avoid the hazards involved. There's a note here, whether an employee is considered to be a qualified person will depend on the various circumstances in the workplace. It is possible that an individual is considered qualified with regard to certain equipment, but is not qualified with regard to other equipment. An employee who is undergoing on the job training and who in the course of such training has demonstrated an ability to perform duties, safety at his or her, her level of training, and who is under the direct supervision of a qualified person is considered to be a qualified person for the performance of those duties. So generally, a qualified persons have had formal electrical training and have demonstrated hands-on proficiency in performing the tasks associated with their jobs. Safety observer, based upon a qualified person's judgment, if there is a risk of serious injury that may adversely affect an employee's respiration or cause severe bleeding or other life-threatening condition, the presence of a safety observer is required. The safety observer must be trained in CPR, first aid, and safe rescue techniques involving exposure to electrical hazards. The safety observer is not required to be a qualified electrician and we'll talk about those steps here in a minute. Rather, the safety observer is someone able to perform necessary rescue, obtain medical assistance, or render emergency first aid. So safety observers do not have to be proficient in the task being observed, but as a minimum shall be briefed on and or familiar with the potential hazards of the task and be able to detect an unsafe condition, an unsafe act or condition during the work, know how to use electrical safety equipment and be familiar with procedures to remove personnel from electrical hazards and will not to touch an affected person. They must be trained in basic first aid CPR AEDs, be familiar with local procedures for obtaining medical assistance. A good example is that of some phone systems, you have to dial a nine before you can dial 911. 
and know where the disconnect uh, switches are located and how to de-energize the equipment. They must also be familiar with and be able to recognize the appropriate safety controls, engineered and administrative, and to select personnel protective equipment. They must also receive initial and refresher training as required and appropriate, which is uh, this, this course. And even right before a job task, you know, they, they may need a quick refresher of how to use a, a safety hook. Standard work uniform. So a standard work uniform means 100% cotton clothing. Oops, trying to change something here. So 100% cotton clothing, that's what I'm wearing there. Uh, undergarments and undershirt, couldn't get a picture of that, sorry. Uh, district furnished and mandated arc rated shirt and pants. So here's the bottom of my pants down here. There's the shirt. Uh, electrical rated safety shoes. My, sa my, my boots are electrically rated. Uh, most boots these days do have a, 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 an electrical safety rating on the soles. Uh, safety glasses. And this is a standard work uniform and it applies to, in, uh, at, 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 at um, Santa Clara Valley Water, it applies to industrial electricians and control systems technicians. So funny because I keep saying Santa Clara Valley Water, but it's not that anymore. It's actually Valley Water now. They shortened it up, but I still that whole phrase always rolls out of my uh, of my of my mouth. So, so work on energized equipment or systems. We want to remind everybody that only qualified personnel personnel may work on electric circuit parts or equipment that has not been de-energized. They must be properly trained regarding working safely on energized circuits and shall be familiar with the proper use of special precautionary techniques, personal protective equipment, insulating and shielding materials and insulated tools. A trained safety observer must be present. So a reminder here, so we must follow the electrical safe work practices that are set up by any company if companies are you know, adhering to anything. We do recommend NFPA 70E, but the, the most appropriate way to work on equipment is to de-energize the equipment prior to working on live parts. So work on energized equipment or systems. Well, no work is to be done on exposed energized parts of equipment or systems until a responsible supervisor has determined that the work must be done while the part or system is energized. Any written energized electrical work permit must be completed and signed by the qualified person conducting the work and a second qualified person to verify the adequacy of the permit evaluation. This stuff this is, is right. Yeah. Yeah, and this is part of um, um, Valley Waters policy here, right, Dennis? That's correct. Yeah, I was just going to say that in a few minutes. This, this comes out of it. We've adopted NFPA 70E. And this is right out of NFPA 70E, and that is the Valley Waters policy. So here's what an energized electrical work permit looks like. This is not a full view. I apologize for that. But it gives you an idea of, of you know, of how you're going to start. You know, you need to list the description of the equipment, the work that's going to be done. And you have to justify why the equipment can't be de-energized or the work uh, deferred until the next scheduled outage. So justification is uh, like we have a larger process that uh, supports um, water going out, the drinking water going out to the valley, right? So we, we do have certain control panels that work has to be done while some other components in those panels are, are functioning. So we fill out this work permit uh, and notify everybody that we're gonna be doing this work. That would be an example. So because we're making water, because it's a source for the community, it becomes important to actually do this work. But most of the time, if not all the time, we defer that work to shutdown so that we take everything offline completely. But now if you're gonna go ahead and do that work, you should have a pre-work meeting. You should discuss the necessary personal protective equipment, uh, discuss the location of the first aid equipment, discuss the egress options in case of an emergency, should be actually two egresses out of every electrical area. 
uh, review the use of emergency contact release equipment, discuss the location of power sources feeding the equipment, and inform uh, our operations staff. This is one of our policies. We always let the operations staff, excuse me, we always let the operations staff know what we're working on. So that way, if something goes wrong, they know it's us. So in doing that review, we'll want to look at um, what, what uh, maybe our appropriate PPE would be, or even uh, what kind of um, incident energy we're, we're going to be dealing with. So this is an arc flash sticker. Uh, this is an older one. So it just basically tells us uh, that it's 0.39 calories per squared. And basically that's the amount of energy that can release. So let me show you the next one here. The next one shows you that this one's 3.4. So what's the difference between those two? Well, any incident uh, energy that's above 1.2, as you can see right here, 1.2 to 4 calories, uh, that is where the arc flash shirt and pants requirements come in. If you're dealing with 1.2 calories and below, it's good to wear that stuff, but at that point you're dealing with shock hazard only. So we'll go to the next slide here. Now these are the more, um, more appropriate uh, uh, stickers that we're now starting to install throughout our facilities. As you can see here, it tells, it tells us this one is 0.42 calories. And it says it's no arc rated PPE is required, but there's still a shock hazard. So shock equipment is required. So you're gonna be like, if you're making a voltage measurement, you're gonna be required to wear a hard hat, safety glasses, hearing protection, and heavy duty leather gloves. Next slide, you can see now we're dealing with an incident energy that's above 1.2, this was 2.1. So it lists, it lists all the types of clothing you need to be wearing for arc rating. It's got to be an arc rated long sleeve shirt and pants or coveralls, arc rated face shield, uh, a balakava. A balakava is actually a, uh, like a sock uh, like you use out in the snow. It covers your head completely. Uh, and then an arc rate jacket or parka, or they even make arc rated rain gear now. And then on top of that, again, the hard hat, the safety glasses, hearing protection, leather safety gloves, and they want to make sure you're also wearing the leather footwear. Why is this stuff important? It brings us to a story uh, that just happened uh, in September, uh, right up in Northern California, uh, the Santa, Clara, uh, Santa Rosa wastewater treatment plant. There's an electrician working up there. Uh, he was working in a 12208 volt panel uh, that I think Robert actually can provide this information if anybody wants to read it. His name was Daryl Clark. He was 58, uh, married, four children, and he was working in a 122 weight volt panel, which a lot of us consider that pretty innocent. He was electrocuted, and he, he the result of his injuries, uh, he was not being able to be uh, brought back to life. So he left us. So very unfortunate, you know, I had, had, had maybe he even worn a pair of rubber, rubber gloves or even leather over protectors that day, he'd still be with us. So these things happen, you know, uh, I talked about my experience as a young foreman with a friend of mine that was working for me. Uh, I call him a friend because I actually just ran into him a lot too long ago. Uh, so I don't know, I guess people I've met throughout my life, you know, I always consider everybody friends. So so emergency contact release, right? What's that involve? Well, we should be wearing insulated gloves, maybe using a rescue hook. Back in the uh, old days when I was an apprentice, we used wooden boards. Um, another good materials uh, that are non-conductive are ropes or a piece of uh, uh, plastic conduit like PVC or even rubber blankets. Here I'm showing uh, the rubber blanket that we would use to stand on if we were uh, working in a panel. The safety observer should also be standing on one of these if you're doing a planned, you know, at work where you're gonna you're gonna be doing it hot. A safety observer would also use what we call this a shepherd's hook, and this is a fiberglass pole with a hook on it, and that hook fits fits conveniently around the person if they need to be pulled off in a situation where um, they've become electrocuted. Uh, 
I seem to have lost one of my slides, I think. Maybe that's one of the ones we took out, huh, Robert? Probably. Okay, uh, let's just go back really quick. So let's talk about being a, uh, oh, there it is. Let's talk about being a safety observer. So if we're a safety observer, right, um, you, you would be, you know, reviewed the beginning of the job. You're going to know, you know, where the uh, emergency uh, release uh, equipment is or even have it in your hands. You're going to know how to shut things off if something goes wrong and your working partner is getting electrocuted. You're going to need to know your um, uh, your uh, uh, first aid equipment. You need to know how to contact 911. Uh, and uh, and you know these are very important things. Uh, one of the things that we discussed was that the safety observer doesn't always have to be an electrician uh, because in some cases, yeah, you can use somebody that's wearing uh, just hard hat and safety glasses and uh, rubber gloves with a sheep hook, as long as they know the, uh, you know, first aid and CPR and all those things. But now if you're dealing with a higher calorie rating than, um, than just our, uh, shock protection, then you're going to need to want to have somebody that's wearing the same exact equipment as you. So, you know, if, if you have to wear that 40 calorie jumpsuit, your safety observer needs to be wearing a 40 calorie jumpsuit. I, I thought we had a picture of that in here. Maybe that's a little further along. We'll get to that. So, but what, what happened is, you know, what happens if you get to the point where uh, you, you come to an, an area and you see somebody that is getting electrocuted, right? So you're going to want to really take a good look at that scene because your first thing you need to do is protect yourself. So examine the scene for the hazards, right? Is there water on the floor? Is there debris on the floor? Are there tools on the floor? You know, is there anything that's going to get in your way that's going to cause you to fall into that equipment? Because you don't want to touch the victim. I've got that bold down here. Do not touch the victim. So if it can be done quickly, you guys, you want to find the power source and shut it off. It's the best way to handle it. But if it can't be done quickly, then you need to safely and forcefully remove the victim from electrical hazard. You need to knock the guy down or pry him off or drag the victim away from the live electricity. But you want to make sure that you don't touch the person involved. Here we go. Here's one of the scene slides I was looking for. Here, I'm holding a, a two by four. I thought it would be funny to make it look like a baseball bat. That's why I did that. So, but the two by four, as you, you can see, I'm using it if the person was standing here, I'm using it to push them out of off the panel, right? Or in this position, maybe I'm using it to, to swing upward to remove the, their hands from where they're attached. And the reason why we're doing that, right, is when we become electrocuted, our muscles will contract. I've got a video we're gonna show you in a few minutes where the guy's hands contracted and he could not let go of what was electrocuting him. Here I'm using a, a piece of PVC. I keep that piece in my truck actually. I use that for stretching. It's really good for, uh, for if you got bad back. So PVC, swing it up to get the person's uh, hands off of what they're touching or push them out of the way with that. You can grab a piece of rope. Here's a piece of rope. Take that piece of rope maybe and double it up and flip it over the guy and that way you can pull him backwards. You can see it in the background. Here's where I'm holding the rope right here and you can see the loop in the rope and you can use that to flip it over the, the person. Or maybe even grab the shirt off your back, roll your shirt up. You can take that and flip it over the person. Pull them off that way. So let's go ahead and watch this video. I'm probably going to struggle again with uh, Fortunately, we have plenty of time.
Ah! I tell you, it's it's much easier to deal with uh, twenty one thousand volts than it is computers. Okay, there we go. So let's watch this video. There's no audio on this video. But I can talk about it. You may have to share like you did last time, Dennis. So. American news outlets no longer provide the truth. Ah! <laughs> Can't find it. What happened? We're doing good on time, you guys. So let me just figure out what I did here. You want to click on the share button again and then pick this screen where you see the video playing and then you have to click share again. That's a tricky one. All right. Thanks, Corey. Hope that helps. It does. I don't know why it's so funny because the last time we did this, I didn't have any issues. Uh, oh, we didn't have this problem before. Okay, let's try it again. Remember to click uh, the app share after you click that. Yeah. Okay, can everybody see it? Yeah. All right, I'll go ahead and start it all over. Sorry, you guys. Man, I'm chasing this thing all over the place. Okay, ready? Here we go. So this shop owner, right? He's got a metal grate that he's using to close up his shop. Grabs the screen, comes down. And you can see right there, he starts getting shocked. His friend tries to touch him, he gets shocked. The guy's just struggling. He tries to pull him off, and there. Watch that again. He can't figure out what to do. Right there, he throws it over his friend's neck, right? But if you watch, he's going to pull twice really hard to get the guy that's grabbing onto the screen off of that, of the, of the, because he's just grabbed onto the screen and he can't get him off until he really forcibly jerks it. Fortunately, this guy survived because of his friend's quick thinking. You can see he starts moving around, starts feeling better, but you can see how, how much force it really does take to um, to do this. Okay, am I back? Can you guys see the screen? Yeah. What the heck? <laughs> hmm, I can't seem to get the uh, can't get the the uh, Zoom stuff to bounce up. Can you guys still see me? Yeah, we can still see you. All right. I don't know why my Zoom stuff's not coming up. Uh. I must have done something here. I'll share it, Dennis. I'll go in and share it one second here. I don't know why I'm, I, I, you know, you go to the top of the screen and everything comes down. There we go. Yeah. the bottom on me. Got it. All right. So let's see, we got nine minutes. Can you guys see it? Yep. 
So after we've removed our victim, we want to call 911. And then with, in accordance with any of our training, uh, provide first aid to the victim until emergency uh, personnel arrive. So this class is something that's required for Valley Water employees to take once a year. So we'll be doing it every year. And it's not just for Valley Water, it's an NFPA requirement for a refresher. Okay. Where is it? So on the table here, you'll see I've got laid out test equipment, a face shield, hard hat. These are insulated tools down here. Here's a uh, 40 calorie suit. That's my suit. It's got a dual fan system in it. So on hot, hot days, I can turn those fans on. It helps keep me cool. And that's a lifesaver on hot days. Okay, we came to questions. All right, you can type your questions in the chat. I do have one question so far, Dennis, and for some clarity's sake, how do we make sure we have an electrical safe work condition? The only way to really make an electrical safe work condition is to shut off the power and then verify that the power is off through the appropriate means. Uh, either measuring the voltage or trying to start the piece of equipment is a good, good way to make sure that it is off. Any questions, anyone? You can just shout out. You don't have to type it in the chat. Just unmute yourself and ask. All right. I got one. I got one. Okay. Uh, Dennis, Dennis uh, you know, we were talking about, uh, you know, testing your equipment and stuff like that. Is there any special thing you should do with your meter, uh, you know, or any kind of electronic equipment that we normally send it back or we just use it for 15 years and buy a new one? No, we have a testing company that we work with and every week they contact us. They ask us if we have any equipment we want calibrated and we tell them yes. We tell them what facility to go to and they pick it up at that facility for us, take it out, test it, make sure it's, uh, it's ready to go and then uh, they bring it back to us. They let us know if it fails uh, and if it needs replacement and uh, so we have to do that once a year. Rubber gloves uh, have to be done every six months. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Uh, here's another question from Brian Burdine. How common is it to find foreign voltage, voltage sources when you think the power has been isolated from the work area? Oh yeah, that's a good one. We uh, we have panels with multiple sources uh, uh, that can be coming into that. Uh, the best thing to do in any panel is use a non-contact tester and sweep through the panel. Then you can identify if there are sources. Sometimes those non-contact testers won't um, won't pick anything up. I've had 64 volts of induction coming in on a panel, and we measured it with a with the non-contact tester. You couldn't see it. But when we measured it with the meter, you could see it. And what it was really weird was then you would measure it with the meter again and it would disappear for a minute. Then it would come back. But it, what it was, was it was induction. So the, con the conductors were acting like a capacitor. They'd build up a charge, then they'd lose the charge. Very interesting. So it's always something to be you know wary of when we're working in panels, even if we think they're de-energized. Here's another question from Miles Johnson. It's kind of related to what you just said, Dennis, and maybe you want to show the slide where you're holding a non-contact contester. Um, he says, given how time sensitive this emergency is, are the tools that can help us quickly test, are there tools that can quickly help us test and confirm the power is actually off? Yeah, here we go. If you look at the table here, this is a this is a typical fluke non-contact tester. This is the one of the best ones to use. Uh, larger ones can actually be sent out for calibration as well. Uh, but these are nice and quick and easy. You take it to a power source and check to see if it's working. Go to what you're looking at, test it, and then go back to the known power source and test it again. 
And, and this will tell you without touching it with the regular meter if you've got power there. Now, you, if, you haven't, if you're troubleshooting with this and you're trying to troubleshoot a neutral problem, it'll never work. Uh, Dennis, also the picture where you were standing there in your clothes, you had the, uh, the other. Oh boy, let's see if I can get to it. Just use the arrows. Just as slow. <laughs> How are we doing on time, okay? Yeah, we are right. Oh, look in the background on this picture. This is a this is a non-contact tester that we can use up to uh, 132,000 volts. It'll also measure as low as 50 volts. Uh, that's one of the best units. That, and this one I send out yearly for calibration. Is it, does that answer the question? Yeah. And this is tied to a fiberglass pole that's extendable, uh, which is great to have. You can stand far away from uh, the highest voltages I deal with at the water district is 21,000. It's nice to stand way back away from that stuff and, and check to see if it's dead. This also have a, has a self-test feature on it uh, that you can use so you don't have to find a known source. That's really nice to have. Good. Any questions? Another question then is how long does it take to get permit approval? Uh, that's going to depend on your organization and our organization uh, might take up to a year. <laughs> And I'm serious about that because in our organization, we not only require two qualified persons to bless the work and sign that permit, we require a supervisor, an engineer, and a unit manager. So to get all those people involved um, and looking at what we're doing, everybody's got to say, yeah, that's okay to do that with it energized. Uh, so that's the term a year. We might need to wait a year before we can shut the equipment down and, and make the appropriate fix. So that's why we actually run a lot of equipment in redundancy so that something can sit there and wait until a shutdown before we need to shut it all off. If when we're not making water, we can shut it all down and work on it. Good. There's a couple statements and questions here uh, related to the non-contact tester. Uh, Robert was talking about how it doesn't work on DC all the time. It doesn't work on DC at all. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, all right. You need an uh, electromagnetic pulse, which is put out by the 60, 60 cycle pulse uh, for that, that uh, non contact tester to, to see it. DC doesn't pulse. You remember our control circuits out here at Advance, Robert and Dennis? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Another uh, question um, So, would that not, non contact pole work for some? some submerged equipment before we step into the water? Uh, not this one, but we actually do have a submersible uh, uh, voltage tester that'll tell you if the water's energized. We have one here at Rinconada. You doing okay on time for this, Robert? Yeah, we're good. All right, buddy. First question. What is the desired electrical state of a piece of equipment before starting a work assignment? Anybody got an answer? We got C, zero energy. Zero energy. That's correct. What document needs to be completed before work on energized equipment can begin? Anybody? B, I see some Bs, energized electrical work permit. That's correct. That energized electrical permit is also covered in NFPA 70E if any of you guys are, have adopted that, uh, that uh, work uh, instruction. Three, a qualified person has? Anybody? 
I see D's, I see D's, A and C is the answer, yeah. We got D for Dennis, how about S for, uh, R for Robert? <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. So, number four, the safety observer must, okay, the safety observer is not required to be a qualified electrician. You remember I talked about that, you guys? That true or false? I see A's here, Dennis. It's true. As long as they know what, what it is specifically they're supposed to do. And then in the higher calorie stuff, we have to be wearing the same PPE. So that's something that uh, the qualified person would determine with, uh, before selecting a safety observer. Number six, a dangerous condition associated with a possible release of energy caused by an electrical arc flash is what? I see some A's here, Dennis. <laughs> Our clash <laughs> hazard. Number seven, in order to safely remove someone from electrical shock condition, the rescuer should. I'm seeing E's, Dennis. There it is, E's. E is correct. Number eight, wearing 100% cotton clothing, undergarments, t-shirt, uh, undergarments, undershirt, uh, District furnished and mandated arc rated shirt and pants, electrically rated safety shoes and safety glasses is called sweaty. <laughs> I see some C's, Dennis. Standard work uniform. Thank you, guys. During the pre work meeting, workers should. What do you guys think? I'm seeing E's, Dennis. And question number 10. Touching an electrical person may cause the second person to exp experience electrical shock. Remember the video. Second guy first got shocked before he used it. <laughs> yeah, I'm seeing A's. True. I'm going to give everybody an A. <laughs> All right. Wonderful. If anybody wants those answers, that's them. All right. Dennis, thank you so much um, for giving us this presentation and all this providing this great information. Thank everyone for attending with us. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great day and take care.